All right, yes, it is a good day today. Uh, you see the shoe boxes here. Those of you online, you can't see them, but uh, they're, they're all around me. And uh, we'll be having prayer um, and uh, ask God's blessing on those in just a little while. But as you can see, our band is still self-quarantined, which is proper and right. Uh, for those of you who don't know, they, they feel they may have been exposed to the virus, and so uh, they've taken these precautionary measures, which we would encourage anybody to do. But it's, uh, they're, uh, they're concerned to make sure that you're safe and that uh, others are safe, and so that's why they've chosen to do so. But as uh, we did last week, we enjoyed some music that has been pulled out of the archives, and we're going to do the same today. But before we do that, let's just take a moment and let's ask God's blessing upon our time. Our Father, may the, the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I stand.
Okay, you may be seated. In just a moment, we'll dismiss the kids, but before we do that, uh, let's take a moment here to pray for these uh, boxes. If you've still got boxes sitting uh, with you, you're welcome to bring them up at this time. Um, beyond this, they'll be going over to the Simpson Creek Baptist Church where there's a collection center uh, reserved for your boxes during the week. And uh, there we go. We'll add to our collection. That's good. Uh, very good. And, um, but let's, uh, let's take a moment to ask God's blessing over these boxes and ask that as they are transported to their destinations, that God would oversee that and they'd get into the right hands of the right people and uh, in order for the gospel to be continue to be broadcast. So let's take a moment here to pray. Our Father, we thank you so much that Jesus is uh, the bread of life, that if anyone eats of this bread, that he will live forever. And when we think about these boxes, that they, they carry the, you know, the gifts that have been uh, provided by the, uh, by the givers here, but ultimately, we pray that they might be instruments whereby people would see and understand that Jesus is the bread of life that they need to eat of him, and that in doing so, that he gives eternal life. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin that is promised because of the cross. Thank you that you sent your son for this very work. And we pray for the pastors and the Christian workers that are on the ground uh, where these boxes will find their destination in the hands of children and also uh, the effect upon the families that these pastors, these Christian workers, would be empowered, whereby they might be able to speak the gospel with clarity and with boldness. We pray for favor to be given to Samaritan's Purse, and that the doors would open for boxes to perhaps go into regions and to specific places that up to this point have been closed. We thank you that as the kids will receive them, that they will be uh, excited for the gift. But we pray that their excitement would even grow as they have an encounter with their Savior, Jesus Christ. So we pray that you would use these boxes to reach beyond just the children, but that they would reach families and communities and that they would be changed by the power of the gospel as set forth in Romans 1.16 that we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So go, go with each of these. Thank you for those who have provided them. And uh, we ask that as, uh, as you oversee the entire endeavors, thousands upon thousands of boxes make their way to the collection centers and then on to their uh, respective destinations around the world, uh, that you would use it for your glory and for the uh, continued broadcast of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, kids, you can go now to your uh, classes. On your way in, if you didn't pick up the sheet that was on the offering box, you can do so, and it uh, provides for you a little outline of some of the things that are going on at Fellowship Bible. And uh, let me just hit a couple of these highlights uh, for you now. Uh, as I introduced last week, we're going to go to two services, God willing, and uh, that's in the month of December. So December 6th, we'll go to a service that will begin at 8.30 and then another one that will take place at 10 o'clock. And uh, if you would consider, if you're coming to this uh, hour um, and you would like to free up your seat for uh, some families who may want to come with their children, then you're welcome to do so. Uh, but they'll be, have two times that you can choose. And it's for the purpose of providing safety, of course, and uh, giving us some room to be able to, uh, to meet and then also provide some access to people who maybe up to this point haven't uh, chosen to come. So this is our, our plan. Also, if you'll uh, take note that on December 6th, we're also going to be enjoying a caroling time together. 
And this will happen out in the parking lot, and the details of that uh, can be found in, uh, on the sheet as well. And then finally, next Sunday is going to be our Communion Sunday. Those of you who are watching online, you're welcome to participate in that as well, as we'll uh, encourage you to go out this week and get the elements of the grape juice and the, and, uh, the wafer, the cracker, and, um, and then gather with your family and I'll lead that, and we'll do it the same way we did it before, where we'll pass it around. You won't be handling anything except for that, uh, those elements that you take. And, uh, and we'll keep it in, uh, in, in such a way that it'll provide some safety there when we take those measures. So anyway, that'll be next Sunday. So come prepared for that. And those of you online, why don't you prepare in your home as well? Let's go now to God's Word, where I want to read from a continued passage that I was looking at last week and would continue on in the next portion, the next paragraph out of 1 Samuel chapter 16. Last week we looked at the anointing of David, and let me read what continues beyond that, and in just a few moments we'll go into the teaching time. 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning with verse 14, and it starts... Now the spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and an evil spirit sent from the Lord began to torment him. So Saul's servants said to him, You see that an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command your servants here in your presence to look for someone who knows how to play the lyre. Whenever the evil spirit from God comes on you, that person can play the lyre, and you will feel better. Then Saul commanded his servants, Find me someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, I have seen a son of, the, uh, of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is a valiant man, a warrior, eloquent, handsome, and the Lord is with him. Then Saul dispatched messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a wineskin, and a young goat, and sent them by his son David to Saul. When David came to Saul, he entered his service. Saul loved him very much, and David became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor with me. Whenever the Spirit from God came on Saul, David would pick up his lyre and play, and Saul would be relieved, feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. May God add his blessing to his inerrant, infallible, and authoritative word. Let's go back into some more singing. Oh, your mercy never fails me In all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God
can be seated. Let's go back to that passage of Scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Have you uh, sensed that over the course of your life, when you look at the scope of the twists and the turns, that somebody has been guiding you, leading you along the path? Have you sensed that? I I certainly have. That these occurrences and how it unfolds is not just a random disorder, but that there is someone who is watching and who is directing, ordaining, if you will, the steps that we take. And that those things that we might call coincidences are really not coincidences at all. They are arrangements that have been ordained by God with a purpose in mind. There is a certain appointed end. Do you know what it feels like to be alone, yet not alone? I do. When we come to the book of Proverbs and all of the wisdom that it contains... There is a couple of verses, there are a couple of verses there that uh, explain what I'm talking about, and they are perhaps the most well-known of the verses that are found in the book of Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Acknowledge Him. That is to submit your plans to His plans. It's not about self-interest, but His will. Acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Now, that promise has been given to Christians, to believers. It's not for everybody. It's for those of us who are part of the family of God. And it gives us reassurance, because life can be very confusing at times. And we look about us, and we flip on the news, and we see society seeming to come unraveling uh, all around us, and uh, the ground beneath us almost feels like we're walking on jello. We're not sure what one day to the next is going to bring. Uh, when I was a kid, we would we would go to a certain place, there would be the pinballs. Remember the pinballs? Those are old school, you know what I'm talking about. And you flip the old uh, spring, and the ball goes up, and it just kind of is at the mercy of all of these influences that just zing, zong, you know, and that's sort of the way life feels at times, and then somebody flips us up back into the mess again. (laughs) Well, the intent of the book of Proverbs has always been to give us wisdom, to know how to navigate through life. But this particular proverb out of chapter 3, 5, and 6 is to instill in us a confidence that we have an all-wise God who loves us very much and who is watching over our life, and He deeply cares what happens And so it reassures us that even when we look about us at a society that seems out of control, that still in all of the murkiness and in all of the uncertainty, there is a God who is directing our paths. Almost as though God is whispering to us and He's telling us, this is the way to walk, walk in it. When we come to the life of David, that's sort of what I see. I see this principle, that is, when our path is God's path, it's the right path. When I look over the course of my own life, how does a boy from Illinois end up in West Virginia? How does that happen, the course of my life? You know, it just, you know, as a, as a personal story, and I, I, I never intended to be a preacher. Uh, In fact, uh, Gail tells me when we were dating that I wrote her and said, uh, I will not preach. That's one thing I won't do. Um, I can't see myself preaching. I don't want to write sermons every week. So I don't think that that's going to be my future. And, um, and, And then when I was at Bible college, I felt compelled to talk with a... uh, a professor, a counselor, and he looked at me and he said, what I advise you to do is to make sure that your major is a pastoral major with a a Greek minor. 
And I found myself saying to him, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and the next thing I know, I've had an assignment where I'm preaching on Sunday afternoons every few weeks to this room full of, I mean, 150 maybe uh, men at a, at a mission in Chicago called the Pacific Garden Mission. And there I would preach every few weeks. It was my turn. Those poor guys had to endure that. And, um, and, and, and I never intended for that to happen. I never really wanted it. And yet this is the direction that I took. And then, as it turned out, over the course of at least two summers, I was um, asked, I didn't even look for it, I asked, was asked if I would take a position, a paid position, to oversee an athletic program in the summertime. And it would be my job as, the, as sort of the pastor on site to provide uh, devotions for these kids. And I, I did hundreds of them. Why? In order to train me. But I never intended any of that to happen. Never really wanted it necessarily. And, uh, but it all kind of unfolded. How do I explain that except somebody was directing my paths? And, it, and, and, and then married my wife, Gail, and then four children, and, and here for going on 23 years. How do I explain all of that when I look at my life? And your life is, has got uh, those points where it's very clear that God is directing. When we look at the life of, of David, where is it that his son Solomon, who wrote that proverb, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and he will direct your steps. Where did Solomon learn that life truth? Could it have been? By listening to his father give the accounts of how he himself was directed along those paths? I mean, surely David must have told his son Solomon the story of when Samuel showed up that day in Bethlehem and, and asked David's father Jesse for his sons. And David was still in the field, in fact, overlooked until it was requested and some servant came out to the field and said, they want you back at the house. And so he arrived there and, and was anointed. He wasn't looking for it. Anointed to be the next king. I mean, that, that just shouldn't have happened. The next king should have been Jonathan. That's how it works, right? It's in the family. It's like the queen, when she steps down in Britain, it's going to be Charles who takes it. And that's the way it should have been in, in Saul's family. Should have been Jonathan. But no, it's David. And he's anointed, and then suddenly David is telling his son Solomon about this experience of the, the Holy Spirit just came rushing upon him, and he felt a power, a power of God that, that he had never, ever felt before. And he said, it has never left me. I've continued to experience that power. Could that have been behind even David Penning in Psalm 23? He leads me along the right path for his namesake. He leads me along the right path. And, and, and it's for his namesake. What is his name? Well, in that context, it's Yahweh Roi. That is, the Lord is my shepherd. And so for the sake of his reputation as a shepherd who never steers us wrong and doesn't take us into a cul-de-sac somewhere, always leads us where we're supposed to go, for the sake of his reputation and for his name, he leads us along those paths. As we submit to him, we submit to Christ. This isn't about self-actualization. This is about submitting our will to his and finding Jesus saying, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, because he's the leader. David saw that the shepherd, the chief shepherd, led him. And it's an amazing story. Now, after David was anointed by Samuel, uh, he went back to the sheep. He went back out to the field. 
to watch the sheep, and he's just a boy. He's not ready to wear the crown. He's not ready to sit on the throne. He's been anointed. Now what? What do you do with that? What do you do when you feel in your spirit that God has something new for you? But that's all you've got is just a feeling, just a sense. God has got me on a path and something's going to happen. I feel a certain proper, holy restlessness within, and he's got me on a certain path, but I don't know where I'm going, but I just know that he's leading me somewhere, and you feel this stirring. And what if you're a young person? What if you're a teenager and you feel deep inside that God is calling you to a a life work, and you may have never shared this with anybody, except that you just sense that he's going to take your talents that he gave you and take those desires that he's implanted within you, and that's all you've got is just a feeling. Now what? What do you do with that? Maybe the Lord is stirring an idea in your soul. And uh, you've never told anybody about what's going on in your mind and thinking about this. And it's been growing over time. And it's almost as if the inner voice of the Holy Spirit is showing you that He has a plan for you. And He's given you a growing desire to do that something, that idea. And you're thinking to yourself, where do I go from here? You know, when David received that anointing, it was very concrete. He knew exactly what he was called to do. Uh, It was no guesswork about it. It was a word from the Lord. But that's all it was. It was just a word from the Lord. And what happened next is maybe why Solomon penned Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 because the Lord directed his father's steps. And I imagine that Solomon, thinking about this, was saying, the Lord directed my dad and pointed him in a direction that was clearly the Lord's doing. It was all God's doing. And it's an amazing story. In a remarkable way, God moved David from watching sheep out in a farm field to sitting in a throne room playing his harp, playing his instrument for King Saul as the royal musician. And and he didn't come knocking at that door at all. It was all God's doing that made that happen. And I've seen that, as I told you, over the course of my own life, where I wasn't looking for anything to happen. It, It came to me out of somebody, well, God, directing my paths. God takes a personal interest in us. He takes a personal interest in you. And everything that God does is with a purpose. It's with an end goal. So the question is, so what is the intent of all of this? Where is it headed ultimately? Because it's bigger than just a career and saying, well, I'm going to have something to do with my life. It's bigger than getting married to that special someone. It's beyond just a new challenge or a fresh opportunity or a new mountain to climb. It's bigger than that. There's something else going on here. What is the end goal, the intent of all this? What does God want to happen out of all of this? And when we look at David's story, we see that there are these takeaways. So what, are, what is the intent for you and what do we see in David's life? Well, the first intent that I see, and I've got four of them that I'll mention here, is that the end goal was that God leads us that we might delight in his wise providence. And we do delight in it, and we ought to delight in it. And we don't know how long David waited between verse 13 when he was anointed and verse 19 where Jesse, his dad, gets a request from King Saul to send his boy to the palace. We, we don't know. I don't think it was the next week, do you? I don't think so. It could have been six months, a year, a couple of years. But there was a space of time between those two verses. What we do see, however, is that God was making all of the arrangements 
And David didn't have to lift a finger. What we do learn in verse 14 is that Saul's mental health began to deteriorate because of an evil spirit that had been permitted by the Lord to afflict him. And this was God's judgment upon the king. Remember that, that Saul had taken such pride in his own uh, wit and his own plans and his ability to make things happen as he wanted to see them happen with a total disregard for what Samuel told him as the will of God. And in, when Samuel gave Saul, a command, an order, and said, this is from the Lord. Saul would take that and he would change it. And either not do it at all or do it partially as he saw fit. And, um, and as a result of that, he took pride in himself. He was full of himself. He took pride in his military record. He took pride in his military bearing, his stature. He was a big guy. He walked in the room, everybody knew who, who he was, and every eye went over to him because he's that, he had kind of personality. And God allowed a demon, an evil spirit, to afflict Saul in the very area where he had once taken such pride in himself. You know, here's a guy, remember, he was a towering man of command until this evil spirit afflicted him and then what happened to him? Saul, apparently, as we look at the, the wording and how it's described, he was afflicted with a paralyzing fear. It was a crippling paranoia that overtook him here. And he became a shell of the man he once was. Haggard, pitiful, easily upset, thinking people were out to get him. Nothing like the way he was before. And even Saul knew that he wasn't well. And all of this came as a result of God's judgment, God's punishment upon him. And so the staff in the palace begins to see what's going on here. And, and, uh, and so they approach the king with an idea, and they say, Your Majesty, uh, would you allow us to look for somebody who has the, the gift of playing soothing music that he might come into the palace and as he plays his music that you might have some composure and that you might be able to think straight as a result of that. And, uh, and so what we find is that instead of Saul telling the staff to mind their own business, he's actually all for the idea which to me is pretty surprising. To me, it would be more in kind with his personality to say, go away from me, but he doesn't. He was favorable, very agreeable to this idea. But again, I think this is evidence of God's directing hand. Out of Proverbs 21.1, it says, the king's heart is like channeled water in God's hand. He directs it wherever he chooses. And I think that God was directing this. And so this opened the door for the search of a fitting musician. And so as it happened, as it happened, somebody on staff knew David personally. Perhaps this person had once lived in Bethlehem and that had gotten a job at the palace and was now serving in the context of the the royal court. And the Lord had, in his way, put the right man in the right place with the right suggestion. And that's how David ended up moving from the field into the throne room. And it was entirely God's doing. David didn't come knocking at the door. He didn't submit a resume. He didn't even know about it. He's out and doing his job until some man comes up to the door of Jesse and says, hey, uh, the king wants to see your son. He wants to have him come and visit. And, and what a confirmation it must have been to David that the words that Samuel spoke over him and the anointing that he received that day, that this wasn't just some kind of a fluke. 
but, but that God was in this. That's what happens in the providence of God. It along the way confirms God's will for our life. It's a wonderful thing to watch these, these uh, occur. And so what is God's intent out of all of this as we look at how he, he directs our paths? Well, I think one thing that we should do is that we should meditate upon it for the purpose of delighting in the Lord in what he has accomplished. It's very important to meditate and to think over your lifetime and to see those places where he directed. Not to do so is a sin. Because not to do so means that you are going to, um, you are going to miss the opportunity of giving thanksgiving to the Lord. Not to do so also sets you up for doubt in the future. Because you fail to remember the past and how God led. And so that when you meet a new obstacle, you, you're not thinking about the past. You're all consumed with the present moment. Where, you know, if I was sitting down with you, I would say, well, can you tell me something about how you see God working in your life up to this point? And then you would begin to recount this and say, oh, yeah. And I'd say, you know, the same God who led you up to this point is the same God who's going to lead you through this too. And it gives us such reassurance and rest in the Lord. David must have never forgot how God arranged these events. And it must have amazed him. He must have delighted in the Lord. He must have enjoyed God because of it. And so David's son, Solomon, wrote, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and He will direct your paths. This is a privilege for Christians. It's not for everybody. It's reserved for those of us who really have the, we have the only, we are the only ones who have the right to say, the Lord is my shepherd. Nobody else has that except for those who belong to the shepherd. So that's the first intent, is that we might delight in the wise providence of God. But secondly, I think in, in the intent of this is that God leads us to make us a blessing to others. David became salt in that context where he was sent. Salt is both a seasoning and a preservative and when he walked into that place, I would imagine the whole atmosphere changed. He walked into that royal court in that place, and, and he was like a pleasant savor. Like, you know, everything felt better and, and tasted better, if you will, because of his presence in that room. He was in the room with Saul, with the staff. He became friends with the staff. He knew them personally, by name, and they knew him, and they loved him. And the atmosphere changed. Why? Because verse 18 says, the Lord was with him. And he's with you too. He's with you too. David's presence acted like a preservative as well, not just a savor, but also preservative because he was a source of healing for Saul. Uh, had, da had David not been there, Saul would have continued to sink deeper and deeper into this dark abyss of paranoia. But it was David's presence. Now, you have both the, the severity and the goodness of God going on here. The severity of God's punishment towards Saul, but also his goodness to the man by sending him David to help him during this time. It's kind of an, an interesting thing there. And notice how David's character is described here. Valiant, a warrior, eloquent, handsome, and the Lord is with him. When, when you, a man or a woman, is, is providentially put into the context of maybe a dark um, office or a classroom or school or university or dormitory or family, um, something wonderful happens when you walk into that environment because you walk in as a believer and the, and the Lord is with you. Paul describes it in his letter to 2 Corinthians as the aroma of Christ. You bear with you a fragrance and you become a blessing and of benefit to others. You become an instrument in God's hands 
to benefit those around you. According to 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16, we are a fragrance of Jesus Christ. And as a fragrance, it has two effects on people. And you'll see this happening in your, uh, in your context. Um, to those who God is calling, uh, you are a fragrance of life. To those who are resisting and rejecting God, you are an odor of death. And, and, but, but nevertheless, nevertheless, though they may not admit it, you are of benefit by being just there where you are representing Christ, whether it's in your, your family, if you have an unbelieving family, or perhaps it's within your company, the business that you work for, or within the government. Many of us uh, in this area work for the government, but you become an aroma of Jesus Christ. Consider Daniel and how he was a blessing to Nebuchadnezzar, who he was serving, and to Darius. And, uh, and, and, and think of Daniel uh, working in, for the government in a very dark place. I mean, these, the people within Babylon were given over to the occult, to astrology, to idolatry, and darkness every single day. Do you think it was easy for Daniel to go to work? I don't think so. I think there must have been days he wished he, couldn't, he didn't have to go and say, man, talk about a draining place. I feel drained every time I leave to come home, having worked in that environment. And, but Daniel did it, and what a great blessing he was to Nebuchadnezzar and Darius. And perhaps you, perhaps you feel a little bit discouraged. You walk on your university campus or within certain classes or among your unsaved co-workers or within a family context, and uh, these people celebrate sin, it, it feels like. They celebrate a lifestyle that is so contrary to godliness. And, uh, and I wouldn't doubt if sometimes you don't really feel all that happy and excited about going to work. But nevertheless, God has put you there, and he's put you there to be a blessing. David, I'll bet you there were days in David's life there when Saul was kind of wigging out on him. And he was in one of these moods where he, he's just talking crazy. And he's in a, such a dark, dark place. And David is sitting there and listening to this display, thinking, man, what am I doing here? And yet there he was. God had put him there to be a blessing. Though, though they may not acknowledge it where you are, where you work, where you go to class, or, or so forth. You're a fragrance, and that is a fragrance to the glory of God, to His glory and His reputation. 1 Peter 4, 11 says, If anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides so that, there's the purpose clause, so that, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. So you see, if your path is God's path for you, you're on the right path. And continue to do so. And expect that something will happen for eternity, today, and tomorrow, and this week. And because I'm going into work, or because I'm going in that context, something will happen that will count for eternity, because I am here, and the Lord is with me. So that is the second intent. And I thought the third intent is that God leads us in order to equip us for a future assignment. And in verses 21 and 22, uh, when he came into Saul's service there, uh, Saul loved him very much. David became his armor bearer, which was a coveted position, by the way. And then Saul sent word to Jesse, let David remain in my service, for he has found favor with me. Now, David needed this. He needed training. He wasn't ready to, to, to uh, step into a position of this kind of level of leadership. And so he was moved from the farm into the, the royal palace to see firsthand how things were governed. He'd never seen that before. And he watched all this. He got to see 
you know, diplomats come in and, and, and how the administration took place. And he looked at this, and no doubt he's knowing one day he's going to be king. He's thinking to himself, I wonder how I would do that. And he's watching all this thing happen to him every day. He had full access, full access to the royal court and to the staff and all of the officials. They knew him by name. And then he became the armor bearer of Saul, which meant that he was entrusted with responsibility on the battlefield. As an armor bearer, he was in the room when they were making up the strategy and thinking about how they're going to meet the enemy. And so he listened to all this and, and how orders were dispatched. David needed that to be in the orbit of Saul's inner circle, and God arranged it all. And he arranged even Saul to have favor toward, uh, toward David. That which God calls us to, God equips us to do it. And, uh, and we never get beyond the point where there is something to learn. And no matter what stage of life you are, we should always be busy about the things of God until he calls us home. And uh, he intends to use us for those purposes. And it means that even at, you know, whatever stage, there is certain thing, there are certain things that we need to learn along the way. I think of my own dad, you know, he's an elderly guy and he's volunteering to work with kids, kids of all things. You've never worked with kids in your whole life. And yet you're volunteering to listen to Bible verses at the Iwana Club. And every week you go in to listen to these kids as an old guy, doing it, volunteering, doing things he had never done before. There's always something to learn, always something to be trained in. And then finally, the last thing here we have is the why God directs us in the paths and to what intent, to what end game is it, is that God leads us to make us more like Christ. It's about sanctification. This is the will of God your sanctification, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. And so for David, it was his faith muscles that were exercised at the royal court. He saw firsthand, he saw how Saul, the king, what happened to this man as a result of resisting God. And you think that he's saying to himself, I'm not going to let that happen to me. I know who's the ultimate king. And it's not going to be me, it's going to be God. And so he's thinking in his, in his own mind about making sure that he maintains a submissive heart to the Lord. Because I don't want to end up like that guy looking across the room. Well, David recognized that God was the one who was in charge. And the best way for him to serve the people was to serve the Lord. And so he took his orders from God alone. So in everything here, we see that David's growing, he's learning, and we are too. He puts challenges in front of us, and he helps us to grow and to learn and to be sanctified, not usually in the times of comfort, but in the times of conflict. And so that's why, perhaps, in his providence, he's put you in a very difficult spot. And you, you've been complaining about it. Don't become embittered over it. Don't complain to the Lord and say, you know, this was a real big mistake. I don't know why you did what you did. But he's the one directing our paths. You know, I fear that there are some Christians when they come to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and it talks about God directing our paths, what they do in their mind is they change it and they start inserting their wish list as though to say, God is going to direct my paths so that all of my wishes will come true. Bad idea. You don't do that to Scripture. No, what it means is that trusting in the Lord and submitting our plans to His plans is the way that He works in our lives for our holiness, for our godliness and fulfilling His purposes to make us more like Christ. And oftentimes it comes through mistreatment. It comes through hardship, things that are unfair, things that we wish didn't, we didn't have to go through, and yet He's using it for His glory. God is not our personal valet. He does not come along and say, I'm here at the door of the hotel to make sure 
that all of your wants are provided. You just look to me. No, no. We can't read, he will direct your paths to mean that God is going to arrange experiences that are pleasant and satisfying as I desire them. The Bible talks about dying to self-interests and living for Jesus Christ. To me, to live is Christ. And to choose the path of the cross, to choose the path of suffering, to choose the path that may, we, we may feel like aliens and exiles in this world, but we choose that because that's, that's the will of God for us. And that's how we enjoy the Lord as we continue to see Him work through those experiences. And we learn something of the supremacy of Christ in it all. We learn to feed on Christ every day. When our path is God's path for us, we are on the right path. Has God put within you a stirring? Do you sense a certain, what we'll call a holy restlessness that's going on inside? And He's put within you a fire that just cannot be quenched? And maybe you've got an idea. It's a big idea. It's a God-inspired idea, but you're not ready for it now. Now what? Well, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and He will direct your steps. He'll direct your paths. Maybe for others of you, you've been placed in an in environment where there is not a gospel witness anywhere to be found except for you. And that's why the Lord has put you there. And he doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to the point of repentance. And that's why he's put you there. For your sanctification as well, and to grow up in the Lord. And so the question that we ought to ask is not to become embittered by this or become a complainer to the Lord every day as to why did you do this? Why did you do this? But to ask ourselves, how is the Lord going to use this to glorify himself and to sanctify me and to give voice to the gospel. How is he going to use this time in my life or even the life of the nation for the voice of the gospel, for my sanctification, and for his glory? Others ought to be able to say that they can see us in us the presence of Christ. Can they do that for you? I mean, really. Can people look at your life and say, you know, I, I don't always agree with what he or she says, and, um, and I'm not into their religion, and I'm not into their church, and I'm not into the kind of things that they do, and, but I can tell you this, that while I don't go along with where they are, I have to say the Lord is with them. That much I can say. Can they say that about you? David had a reputation that the Lord was with him. And wherever he showed up, he was a presence for Christ or for the Lord, and he certainly was a blessing to others. May we be as well. Let's pray about it. Our God, we uh, come before you and recognize that you are the one who's ultimately in charge. And we thank you and... Uh, we bow before you as the King, the Master, truly the Lord of our lives. And uh, we worship you because uh, we delight in you. We love you. We enjoy you. And we ask that you would continue to manifest yourself in the years to come by directing our steps, directing those steps, those who are watching online and those who are within this uh, company here, within this room and uh, we will certainly look back upon it, and I know that we're going to see that you were the one who arranged so many things that we could not have done on our own. Thank you for how you lead us, for your glory, and for our sanctification and our holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's stand together because we're going to be visited once again uh, by our worship team here. Amen. Let's stand and sing one more song together.
break the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and then through the darkness your loving kindness so through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin has spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me his own beautiful Savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living Let's sing it out this morning. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim. fail. You have never failed us yet, and you never will. Lord, we praise your name, the mighty name of Jesus, in which we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you, and have a great week.